Okay, we'll go ahead and call the July 6th <coughs> meeting of the Historic Preservation Commission to order. Can we have the roll, please? Commissioner Sibley. Here. Commissioner Fenster. Here. Chairman Lane. Here. Commissioner Norton. Here. Commissioner Jacoby. Here. Commissioner Barnard. Here. Thank you. Thank you. We do have a quorum. Uh, so then we'll move on to approval of the June 1st uh, meeting minutes. Do any of the commissioners have any comments or corrections on those minutes? And if not, I'd entertain a motion. Okay. Got a motion to approve from Commissioner Fenster. And a second from Commissioner Sibley. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. The minutes are approved. Report from the chair. I do not have anything uh, tonight to report on, so we'll just move on to communications from HPC staff liaison. I uh, don't have too many updates, um, aside from the fact that uh, we have been in conversations with our um, general planning consultant to, um, and their historic preservation staff about um, getting work going on a survey plan for the city of Longmont. So um, that is the, the wheels are turning on that. We just are working on some administrative and scoping processes with those. Um, we did receive, I think I may have mentioned this at the last meeting, we have a proposal from Carl McWilliams on the Tower of Compassion um, cultural resources survey so we can set the uh, framework for getting that um, landmarked and just need to do some administrative follow-up on that and get some purchasing done and get things signed there. So aside from that, I don't really have any additional comments or things to, items to report. Glenn? I expected the chair to ask me about the HBC uh, demolition. I was going to. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I'm prepared. I just got uh, some changes from our city attorney, so it doesn't look like anything real substantial. So I'm going to go through that in the next couple of days. I'm meeting with them on Tuesday, so I hope to have them, plan to have them before you um, at your August meeting. And then we'll go ahead and, and move it right into city council's process. So hopefully August, September, in that time frame, hopefully we can get that um, vetted out with council. Okay, great. Yeah, that's good news. Uh, thank you. Uh, any commissioner questions for staff? No? Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, next we have uh, public invited to be heard. Anybody in the audience who is not here for an agenda item? Everybody here is for something on the agenda, so we'll go ahead and close the public invited to be heard and move on to our first action item, which is a public hearing for a certificate of appropriateness for window replacement at 545 Collier. Staff, do you have a report for us? I do, thank you so much, uh, Chair and members of the commission. So we have a window request, uh, gosh, bear with me for a moment, let me get my sentences back in order. We have a request for window replacement at 545 Collier Street. Um, this property is at the southwest uh, corner of Collier and 6th Avenue, and so we have a request to replace all of the windows in the home. This particular property is known as the Bemis Rowan House, and it was designated in 1985. So the applicant has indicated that um, they're seeking to replace the windows because um, the existing windows are inoperable. They've got some safety concerns regarding loose glass, um, very big concerns regarding efficiency. Um, this particular winter was, um, I think we know, pretty rough, and at one point, uh, she's indica she indicated it was down to 42 degrees in inside the house. Um, the other um, reason citing was the rationale as a rationale for replacement was that there's limited availability of contractors who do this restoration work. So the proposed replacement windows are from the Marvin Windows Ultimate Woodline. 
they are solid wood. They are made of pine, um, so a soft wood, um, double paned and would match the existing one over one style. Uh, the applicant does propose to incorporate the original windows into a future greenhouse on the property. So as part of, um, as part of the application and review process, I did re uh, request that photographs be provided of all of the windows in the house. So the next few slides do show uh, the existing windows. You'll see they are one over one um, sash windows of uh, varying sizes throughout the home. And these are included in my report as well. So just going through the um, criteria for, for review, um, there are four criteria that we have to consider when evaluating a certificate of appropriateness. Um, the first one is whether or not the work meets all applicable design gui guidelines approved by council, given that this is not a locally designated district, but just a, but rather a locally designated property. Um, we don't have those standards or those guidelines, so um, this criteria does not apply. Um, the second would be um, whether the proposed work preserves, enhances, or restores and does not damage or destroy the exterior architectural features of the property. Um, so as a general rule, replacement of original wood windows um, with modern replacements is discouraged for historic properties given the importance of windows to the integrity of architectural features. Um, the windows, the photos of the existing windows provided by the applicant um, don't seem to depict windows that are beyond repair and they seem to be salvageable. Um, we do recognize the difficulties that historic property owners have been having finding qualified contractors for this type of work. Um, and we do understand also that this work is oftentimes beyond the ability of, of a lot of homeowners to do themselves. Um, a big issue that was cited was lead times, um, and so the applicant did provide documentation from their contractors stating that they were in fact available in the fall of, of this year to begin the work, and that lead times from their storm, storm window manufacturer were uh, um, along the lines of 22 weeks. This doesn't seem out of the realm of reasonable for this type of work and these types of contractors, given that it is a pretty specialty um, field. Um, so we don't, we're not of the opinion that the condition is severe enough to warrant wholesale replacement, and we also aren't convinced that the lead times are, are so long as to um, present a, a really severe hardship for, for the property owner. They may disagree with me, but um, this is, this is um, my professional opinion on this. Um, the third criteria that we have to evaluate is whether or not the work adversely affects the special character um, of the landmark. Um, and so the windows would match this one over one style of existing windows, and they are um, wood rather than composite aluminum or vinyl. Um, but we've had this discussion with this commission many times. Uh, windows, original windows are a really important feature of historic homes and should be preserved whenever possible. Um, so we're not, sat we're not satisfied, we're not of the opinion that this criteria has been satisfied either. Um, the fourth criteria would be whether the architectural style, um, arrangement, texture, and materials would be compatible. Um, the proposed replacements are of the same style and of a similar material as the windows to re be replaced. However, they are modern replacements. Um, so technically this criteria has been, has been met in that they are similar in terms of the style and the materials. So in terms of staff's recommendation, um, your staff has three, has, the commission has four, four options. You can either approve the application as proposed, you can approve the application with conditions, including approving in part, denying in part, you can defer action on the application based on the need for additional information, or you can deny this application. Um, so staff does recommend denial of this application based on the fact that review criteria two and three have not been met. Um, specifically also the windows are not sufficiently deteriorated to warrant replacement. Um, we do recommend repair and installation of storm windows um, as an alternative to complete replacement. Um, as noted, the applicant's contractor does indicate 
that they have availability starting this fall. You know, staff does recognize that fall is you know seasonal. Seasonal availability can can be very vague, and fall does include any time from September 21st to December 21st. Um, so that that is a concern. I, I do understand, um, but we just don't feel that the lead times are sufficiently long as to be unreasonable. With that, I will. Um, open it up for questions. We do also have the applicant here to discuss their proposal as well. All right. Thank you. Uh, before we open up for the applicant, do uh, any commissioners have a question for staff? You, uh, you characterized uh, the replacements oh. as, quote, modern replacements. What does that mean? That means um, modern manufacturing techniques, double-paned windows, um, spring mechanism versus sash weights and ropes. Commissioner Barnett. I'm trying to balance two different ideas. One is the comment about the air coming through the windows and that uh, temperature is very low in the wintertime, um, along with it isn't really necessary, they haven't deteriorated enough. And so I'm trying to understand from the staff's perspective, what is, how, did, how, do, how are we supposed to consider when something is deteriorated enough? And, and that's the first part. And the second part is, is there, the last application we had was very different because the, the, the replacement was going to be not the wood replacements. But this is a wood replacement. So is, is it the feeling of the staff that there are no circumstances that, that a full replacement would be, uh, vind would be vindicated? Uh, or, or just how far along the deterioration line does something have to uh, progress? Sure. Before that's the case. So in the previous case, um, we did I, I did recommend approval based on the fact that the windows to be proposed for replacement were on the upper story, and I know we had some disagreement. My my thoughts and based on the, the the documentation I was provided in that case is that those upper story windows weren't necessarily original. They didn't appear to have a sash rope and weight mechanism. They seemed to have. A spring mechanism so I was not of the opinion they were original um, in this case the applicant is um, seeking to um, re replace all the windows in the house rather than just the upper story so the visual impact will be at street level so that is um, a consideration so I do have let me find the page so in terms of and this is a, a handout that Commissioner Lane, Chairperson Lane, provided um, from the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And it is basically about when do you repair and when do you replace. So if you go through this, the determination is window A could be repaired. It is has loose a loose meeting rail some missing glass, that, is, that can be repaired. Um, ditto B, which has um, missing glazing. Um, that glazing is a really big component of keeping windows airtight. And um, the exterior photos I was provided, it did appear that there was some glazing that was missing um, and that needed to be replaced. And that is, that's a very important um, part of keeping windows airtight. Um, speaking from personal experience on that one. <laughs> um, so um, in terms of, you know, really of all of these windows that are shown on this, on this document, the only one that was deemed replacement was absolutely needed. Um, so window D, it says replacement likely. Um, they were missing glass, but they were also missing the frames. So there really wasn't a lot to repair there. Um, but really, with the um, exception of an F and G down here, is this the 
white mouse, that would be extremely helpful. These are categorized as replacement is probably necessary. They're bore on the borderline just because the extensive nature of the repairs. Um, so it's takes it, it there are, you know, it's pretty amazing what can be restored. Um, in terms of weather tightness, um, there's really good evidence that um, well-fitting storm windows can substantially increase the efficiency. Um, you know, stopgap measures. There are various films and stuff if you if you need if you need a cost-efficient thing. But ultimately, um, replacing you know re reglazing the windows can go far for for helping with some of the drafts. So. Um, Ultimately, from my perspective, um, I'm more inclined to support replacement of windows that are not historic or original to the home, um, which it wasn't clear that that was the case back in February. These are def very clearly original to the home um, in this particular um, property, uh, and therefore, you know, they, they aren't in sub such substantial disrepair as to require um, as to require um, replacement. Okay, Commissioner Jacoby, you had a question. Yes, um, I know when we talked about the last set of windows, and I gave you a name of someone who rehabbed windows. The city, you said the city has a listing of some people who repair them. Do we still have that list? Do you know how many names are on that list? So the city does not maintain a list per se. Um, my practice is to refer people to the History Colorado contractor page, since that is a, a more robust okay. page and, and encompasses quite a few contractors. Um, ever, pretty much everyone who you know we, we've encountered at History Col the um, Saving Places conferences are all on that list. Okay. Um, the challenge is you know some of them are on, in different parts of the state. Some of them only do commercial. Um, and, and there are long lead times for quite a few of them, so. Yeah, I was trying to get a handle on how many people are actually available I in the Longmont area. Don't, I, know there's... I don't have a number, okay. unfortunately. Right, and that's that's really not something that's easy to track, too, because they do come from other parts of the larger area. Okay. Barnard, did you have another comment? Okay. I, I, I think, am I on? I'm on? I think that I think uh, Commissioner Jacoby's question is an important one because we have to deal in the in the world of reality, and if there are uh, I don't know how we can get a handle on on this because if there's nobody available to do any of this work, then saying well it's a requirement that we have to have this work done isn't uh, a realistic requirement. And we're basically saying that under no conditions will we ever approve them because you can never get them repaired because there is no one to do that work. Um, now I'm not saying that's the case. And in fact, I was a little disappointed in the application talked about the ability and the time requirements for getting the windows repaired or replaced. But there was nothing in the application about any work that's been done or any evidence presented as to the uh, uh, any attempt that was made or, or what the reactions were from people who repaired them. So, again, I, I, I would have liked to have seen that. It would have helped my decision. But on the other hand, I also think the other part is what responsibility do we have um, as people who are enforcing something um, if we're, what we're enforcing is not a realistic possibility? So if you look at, there's an attachment towards the end of the, um, let's see, it's before the Cultural Resources Survey, and that is an email between um, the contractor who the applicant, um, gosh, I'm trying to find it in the package now, it's kind of lost. Um, page 26. Thank you very much. <laughs> 26? Page 26, yes, there is, there is correspondence with, um, Heritage Window Restoration, um, LLC, President Greg Connor, um, that they are booking new work and in, out into the fall of 2023. Right. Well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that. Yeah. So I mean, that's, that, that's what we know. We know that 
in the fall of 2023, they can do a full replacement. Mm -hmm. But no, the, that that's for the repair work. That's for that's for the repair. That that is for the repair work with. Um, I, I'm sorry, I missed that. Where where I thought I'd read this. Where does it talk about repair work? So, the company is Heritage Window yeah. Restoration. Yeah, they're, they, they're the, they, they, they would be the supplier well, of the I mean, storm right. windows. I understand, but the presentation that's been made is that the, 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 the windows will be replaced by this company. That is not the and company that will be who would be replacing the them. Okay, so it's... Okay. That is not the company that would be replacing them. It would be um, a different company who deals in Marvin windows who would be replacing them. Okay, because if you look at page 26, it says, it says it's from, from the applicant, it's working with you, Jennifer, an application to replace my historic windows. Can you relay the lead time to me? And that's what was responded to. So I don't see anything here other than the fact that the word restoration is in the name. That, so that, 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 that the fall time is for replace is for restore is for re repair. Uh, so signature windows and doors is the contractor who would be replacing the windows, um, and that was the the quote um, previous with the product information. Um, the email exchange that particular with uh, Heritage Window Restoration they don't do replacement they do restoration and storm windows. We don't have any quote on that. So the reference is custom storm windows. If you're doing window replacement, there would be no need for storm windows. So this was about the restoration and, and preservation with storm windows. So it's your, it's your, your understanding is that this company would, would do the replacement. No. If, uh, yeah. Or, or could do uh, it. I, I believe, Doug, uh, Commissioner Moran, sure. I think we could get the applicant up here. Yes. They could have uh, an opportunity to explain, and, and I, they could probably answer that question more clearly as yes. well if, we, if we're good. If there's no more questions for staff, I'd like, if, the, if you'd like, you're, you can have the floor. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> and there's the microphone. And oh, cool. On. Is it going to work? Yes. Cool. Um, I'm Lizzie Wolf. I'm the applicant. Hi. Um, so to clarify a few things, um, my understanding from the contractor who I contacted to put storm windows on my windows, not for repair, this was simply to get another pane of glass there so that I can keep my house warm, um, as an alternative to replacing the windows. He told me that his project start date is in fall and production of those windows is 22 weeks, bringing us most of the way through winter or into spring. So my kids and I would be living in that house through winter. Um, if they were to be repaired, um, and I have some other things to also answer your concern, I did, some, I did take some other measures on my own in order to air seal these windows for the last two winters, and I'll go into that as well. I'm sorry it wasn't in the application. I, I don't think I quite knew what I was getting myself into when I filled out the application. So I've offered all that information now. Um, I'm really poor at speaking in front of people, so I'm going to read if that's cool with you guys. Um, okay, so um, it's important to me that I note initially um, that I have a passion for historic houses. This is not the first Victorian home that I've owned and restored, um, and it's why I own one. I love historic homes. I have a passion for it. Um, today, however, I'm here to present the facts of the condition of the home that I care for so much. Um, we all know I want to replace my windows with double pane, all wood windows. She made that extremely clear with that wonderful presentation. If I had known that you were going to put the pictures on the presentation, I might have cleaned my house first. Um, but I'm going, I plan on replacing them with identical shapes, measurements, and pane styles. Um, so fixative measures that I've taken to insulate my home in the winter include caulking the gaps in the windows to stop the air coming in, 
the op they're not operational anymore because they had to be coughed because there was air leaking in through my windows. Um, but almost every one of my windows required caulk. I did that. It was mostly effective. So in addition to that, I sealed the interior with plastic coating to remove drafts. And many of those windows, the plastic like billowed out. <laughs> there was definitely air coming in. Um, in addition to that, um, I did professional weatherproofing of the front and back doors, which are original. Well, the front door is original. The addition is from the 40s, I think. So the back door doesn't really count as Victorian or historic. Um, and then um, I did spray foam insulation in my crawl space to ensure that the heat was not coming out through my floor and through the, the foundation. These types of foundations are rocks put together. And so there's lots of gaps. You can see daylight through them when you're in my cellar. Um, well, not anymore. Um, and professional operational window repairs done by Heritage Restoration. That's how I got this contact. I've actually already used him for some operational, some of the larger operational repairs on my windows, including broken glass, missing locks. Um, I didn't have him reseal all of them and go through a full restoration because that wasn't financially feasible for me at the time. But I did have him address the larger issues that were more pressing. Um, and then short-term measures that I've taken to live in my home in the winter with my children not bring my children downstairs unless necessary. And I really want that to sink in. My kids are five and three, and they don't come downstairs in the morning. They cannot come downstairs without socks and shoes and coats. There was a point in February where it reached below 43 degrees. 43 was an average. Um, I ran space heaters 24 hours a day for weeks at a time, huge energy waste, huge expense, and it didn't even work. <laughs> um, I ran my brand new energy efficient furnaces. I have two of them, one upstairs, one downstairs, at full capacity almost 24 hours a day. With these measures deployed all at once for the last two winters, the interior of my home has often hit lows of 43 degrees, as noted, thank you very much, um, and even saw below 40 degree temperatures in the really tough cold parts of winter. Um, in the month of February, for two years in a row, my energy bill has exceeded $400. I have records of my energy bills. If anyone wants them, um, I have them all printed out, um, uh, proving, obviously, these spikes in cost. Um, okay. If no one's interested in those, and I understand because that's boring... Um, there are some additional, oh, I forgot, a, oh, no, there it is, ha <laughs> ha, I found it. Um, so because of the um, energy bill situation, I wanted to go a little bit into the realistic side of a $400 energy bill uh, for me personally. I'm a single mom of two small kids. We are a single income household, um, and so it is not my desire to lay out my finances uh, to be recorded in City Hall, but I will. Um, I make $4,980 a month. My mortgage is $2,416. Daycare for my children is $1,350. Those are my largest expenses. Um, for everything else, food, clothes, bills, gas, insurance, incidentals, any kind of crisis that may happen, that leaves me $1,214. In the month of February, for two years in a row, 30% of my disposable income went to energy. Um, if you do choose to take these, bal these um, balance sheets, you'll see that I struggled to pay them. <laughs> there were a couple months where I was lapsed. Um, I have no shame in admitting that. Um, financing windows will add $75 a month to my mortgage. I plan on taking out a loan for it. Uh, far preferable to the spikes to $400 a month in the cold seasons um, and similar heights when it's hot and my AC is running and the cold air is coming out of my windows. Um, okay. And then I, pr I promise I'm almost done. Um, I'd like to note some of the modern updates that have been done to the home to give us some perspective on the home in general. The kitchen and bathroom addition, about 250 square feet off the back of the house, 
um, was added in the 40s, as best I could find on the City of Longmont website. And um, it significantly changed the look of the house. Um, we all agree that houses need bathrooms and kitchens. So seems reasonable to me. Um, the garage was added onto the original outhouse, which <laughs> is not on the register, but I think it's kind of cool. There's a woman door and a man door, and the woman door is slightly smaller than the man door. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, but they added a garage on it in a haphazard way, and now it's unusable. It's a structurally unsound structure sitting on the corner of my property. Um, but that was approved, or at least executed. I don't know if it was approved. Um, when I moved in, and then so after I purchased the house, I replaced the electrical. There was existing live knob and tube wiring everywhere in the house. And I don't know if you know anything about this, but that's incredibly dangerous. <laughs> um, so we replaced it all. That was $19,000. Um, I put a new roof on the house. That was $22,000. Another modern luxury um, that is we all deem necessary, um, but did do away with original material of the house. Um, and I put in an energy efficient HVAC. Two air conditioners, two furnaces, one on each level so as not to compromise the structure of the home, um, $32,000. OK. Um, well, I've already gone over the discrepancies in the report, the 22-week lead time. That's for storm windows. I think that's probably where the confusion came in. I don't know how long it would take them to repair the windows. I or Jennifer have not spoken to him about that, so we don't know. Um, but the start time to scope the project would be fall, um, which, as you noted, could this extend into December. What are calendars? Um, just kidding. Um, what some of the things that I would hope would sweeten the application a little bit um, that I've already offered to finance significantly more expensive windows for the sake of continuity. These are wood windows. Um, they will not be removing any of the trim on the inside or the outside. Um, that is additional labor, but it was well worth the cost. And I've also offered to use the, uh, the existing sashes to erect a greenhouse on the property. I've always wanted a greenhouse anyway. And I think it would be a cool way to adaptively reuse, as is stated in the ordinance that gives you guys your authority, the materials um, on the property. And also like put them on display, because they are really cool, however inefficient they may be. Um, let's see. <laughs> I think there are two more points I would like to make, and they're short. I've already made this point, but they are the center of my entire universe. My children live in this home, and it's important that they are warm in the winter. I am a tax-paying citizen. I have lived here for th over, over 13 years, and I've owned more than one historic home. I love historic homes. Um, When I bought this home, it was a poorly maintained office building. They did unspeakable things to the original materials in that house. I don't even want to get into it. But I bought it because I saw its potential. And I transformed it from an office, and it had been that way since the 70s, and made it into a beautiful family home, adding to the beauty and the historic culture of my neighborhood. Um, I think, I hope. I hope that this speaks about the respect that I have for the age of my home. Um, and I really appreciate you guys earnestly listening to my side of the story. The story for me centers around my family and the livability of the home that I've purchased for us to live in and that I lovingly take care of. Um, yeah, and I guess I have some supporting facts, but I'm open to questions. I know I talked for a long time. I'm really sorry I was following a script. No worries, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, commissioners, questions for the applicant? Yeah, Commissioner Benson. Uh, I'm concerned with the visual effects. Could you do that again, mm -hmm. please? Uh, there's. Yeah. I can't. Sure. Yep. Uh, I'm concerned with visual effects. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were to do the replacement you're proposing, mm -hmm. would there be a significant visual difference 
Mm. No, other than the fact that antique glass does have a very beautiful effect to it, um, and that cannot be replicated. The wood, the size and width of the framing, it's all custom to my specifications. Um, and so other than the glass, it would look the same. I'd say that unless you're on this commission or you walk by my house every day, you might not notice. Um, but that glass is beautiful, which is why I want to keep it on the property and do something with it. Uh, piggybacking on that question, do you know if Marvin's plan would be to remove the frame of the existing window or just to remove the sash and put this... So it would be frame and sash would be removed? No. And so I'm okay. nodding because that's what I do when people talk to me. Sorry. Okay. So <laughs> the question is really, does the frame in the replacement scenario, would the frame also come out or would their new window in a frame, sash and frame, fit inside the framed opening? Their left? new window, the sash and the glass would fit inside the existing frame. All the trim work would be untouched. It wouldn't even need to be removed. They right, but there, there is a, this is a subtle difference, but, but if you, right now, you have an, an existing frame in which the sashes sit, and so when, when a replacement window is used, the sashes are often removed, mm -hmm. the existing frame is laid in place, and so the new windows are actually smaller mm. than the original by the, the dimension of the frame around the, the new windows that are being put in. So there's another level of detail yeah. that's added that is a little bit different, uh, that is more typical. Yeah. Um, so I don't I, know. If you know I, I exactly don't know. Detail, he did talk to me about that when we were walking through the it's house. A technical. But I could not. Yeah. Po I could not accurately recall that information. Okay. That's Sorry. Right. No, no worries. Uh, let's see. Uh, first, I have Commissioner Jacoby. And then I'll get you. Just, yes. Thank you. So. I, I I was adding up the windows and the bills here. It's 18 windows, is that mm -hmm. right? Yes. Okay. And okay. you said that there's a safety concern, and that is that they can't open, or what is the safety concern? Well, the safety concern is... Oh, is that me? Yeah, you're probably just getting a little too close. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the safety concern is when the glass breaks. It breaks incredibly oh. dangerously. I have small children, yeah. and they are head height or above the bottom of those windows. Well, I have noticed that you have beautiful poured glass windows. I, mean, I live a block south. You have the same. Oh, cool. Some, are all of them poured glass, do you know, or half of them still and half of them replaced at this point? Do you have mm, any idea? What, what I know that in the original house, the original bottom floor and in the addition that was built 10 years later above, there is the same quality of glass. In the addition in the back, I don't think okay. so. You, you can see that beautiful yeah. ripple. It's, yeah. it's gorgeous, which is why I want to keep it on the property, for right. sure. Um, so the safety is the issue with the glass being fragile. Being Breaking illogically, right? Okay. So, like, when, when you smash a modern window... Oh, Herb, I, Herb has to turn his mic off. Oh, oh, I'm oh. sorry. Sorry, I didn't see that. Oh, there you go. Thank you. See if okay. that works. Okay. Um, it might be me. Um, when you break modern glass, um, it's shatter safe. Right, right. And it's when you And when you break antique glass like that, um, I've heard them lovingly recall, um, referred to as limb removers. So, <laughs> not to be right. inflammatory, but they break incredibly dangerously. Okay. So, it's the antique glass. And easily, because they are antique glass. Well, you'd have to be careful in a greenhouse, too. But anyway. Um, My children don't live in a greenhouse. Inoperable windows. You say they're inoperable. Before, you, ca you caulked them all shut. Is that right? Yes, most okay. of them. I caulked them in between the two. Before you caulked them, could, could could some of them open, or did half of them open, or none of them? They all open. open. Oh, they all open. They so all they were open. operable before the caulking. They open. They have okay. gaps. They just they're not they they're not gaps. lined up, right? Yeah. So yeah. my solution to that, with my limited resources, was to caulk them. Okay. I was like, oh no, it's cold out. There's cold air shooting into my house. I'll caulk it. That's how it went. All so. Right. I think there's other class questions. Safety and operability. Um, I think that was it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Commissioner Norton. Thank you. Um, so I'm incredibly sympathetic to everything you described. 
Um, it, also, living in historic houses and working in historic preservation, I'm slightly alarmed that what you described is not going to be fixed by this immense cost of replacing these windows. Um, have you ever had any sort of historic structure assessment or energy audit or something like that done yeah, to your house? Yeah, where they do the heat gun and they see where the heat's actually being lost. And, I did and that. where, like, okay, and... It was primarily through the windows. Okay, that's... With two new HVAC systems in the house and still unable to get up to 42, as well as some of your descriptions of um, like being able to see like chinking through your through your foundation and stuff, um, knowing that oftentimes windows are not the even old windows, even even poor repaired windows. Um, rarely account for the majority of heat loss in a home. Right, so. usually through the roof. It is. Yeah, yeah. and so and both the attic and the crawl space huge. have been insulated with okay. spray foam. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> um, you just might have some larger issues at this immense expense, and I'm, I'm saying this as a, a professional um, to someone who's obviously in need of taking care and in, in wanting to, and I totally recognize that. But I, I would want you, before you move forward with this, to recognize that what you've proposed to do today might not actually fix your problems. Yeah, that's my concern with actually the alternative suggestions. Yeah. Um, you know, if replacing my windows won't work, a storm window's not going to work. And fixing the operation ability of the existing windows is not going to work either. So what I'm actually, well, no, because what it will do is it will increase the efficiency. But if you're not losing the majority of your heat through your windows, like it sounds like there's something else going on in your home. What could it be? Uh, typically, it's often lack of insulation in the walls. That's the primary factor for loss of heat in any home. And what does one do about that with lath and plaster? That's always a great question. Do the best they can with what they've got, I suppose, would be window replacement, right? I can't Not break open my walls, can I? Yes. <laughs> yes. But what, I, what I'm saying is that replacing your windows might not fix your problem. You might still have huge energy bills. Um, and so I think that thinking about the... Um, storms and maybe doing a cost-benefit analysis of what the storms and the repairs that staff has recommended um, might be a more reasonable option and then thinking about where your actual heat loss issues are. So I've done my homework on this. I had someone come out and do a heat assessment. That's why I insulated my attic and my crawl space. Okay. Um, and that's why I sealed the leaks with caulk and plastic as best I could on my own. I don't have the luxury of spending $20,000 on storm windows to then spend forty-five dollars on windows. I don't have that luxury, so. Commissioner Kobe. Okay. Um, you know, I again, I do have a house about the same age as yours, 1886. And I... Uh, I, when we talked about this last time, I had some skepticism about the data showing that uh, repaired storm, uh, historic windows with storm windows would be effective. But So I did some research before tonight's meeting. And I, if you go to the National Park Service website where they talk about historic preservation, they point out a 2002 study confirmed that installing a storm window over historic window can achieve similar thermal performance to that of a lo new low E window. And that study was done at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. If you use a, a very trusted source such as thisoldhouse.com, you know, um, it was reading there how to repair sash windows. And I can tell you I've done some of the repairs myself on my windows. Some are very easy and you can do yourself. You don't have to wait. Like the glazing is very simple and I've done that. Uh, I built some of my own interior storm windows and I've had some commercially replaced. It depends on what level of ability you have. And yes, if you're a single mom with two kids, I understand who's going to have time for that. But a lot of this could be hired out to a simple handyman. Um, 
but this old house said, single pane, double hung windows for the 19th century don't have the best of reputations. They can be notoriously drafty, full of rattles, loosen the joints, or can simply refuse to budge. But as a number of studies have shown, a number of studies, these windows are, if these windows are properly weather stripped and paired with good storm windows, they can match the performance of new double pane uh, wind windows for much less than new ones cost. And you're saying that expense is a significant issue for you. And I, I understand. I think if you can get the same performance for less money, you're going to do yourself a, a huge favor. When I had my energy audit, he said, yes, your windows are horrible. Don't replace the windows. Put in storms. Um, I don't know what your energy audit said, but I'd go back and read it. Because even if that's a primary source of loss of heat, it may still benefit you economically to uh, put storms and have them revamped. I'm just, I'm just saying, I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think I read the article that you're referring to when I was desperate in the dead of winter trying to fix my windows. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, the first source that you cited, um, I would love to read more about that. The second is a for-profit television show. So I can't really, I can't really take that to heart. However, I do have, um, Information from energystar.gov saying that single pane windows replaced with double pane can see a 22% savings, whereas a single pane with a storm window over it is a 10% savings, and that's a government website. Um, and I'd be happy to um, offer that information. Um, I do, I, I appreciate the idea that, that it's about cost savings for me, because it really is. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a one-income house. I love living in my neighborhood, and I would hate to be priced out, right? That's not what we want. We don't want normal people priced out of nice neighborhoods. Um, and I don't um, think anyone really wants that. But it all seems a little bit like a gamble, doesn't it? I mean, there's a lot of mites being thrown around. There's a lot of maybes. There's a lot of, you know... <laughs> I weighed all my options. I looked at all these options. Every time Jennifer asked me, did you talk to this type of contractor? My answer was yes. Here's the bid that I received. I have looked at all my options. I've had the energy rating done. Um, and and for, for my home that I love so much, this was the best possible scenario that I could figure out. Um, none of us are window restoration experts, right? No, none, none in the room. So I guess we're all just operating off of the best information that we have, right? Are you? Are, are, are you? We work in construction. Right, but you don't repair windows, do you? I don't. Okay, so so I wouldn't call you a window restoration professional. Um, so yeah, so we're all just making the best assessment of the situation that we can, knowing that there are an impossible number of variables here, and no one really knows the answer because every website has different information. Um, so yeah, that would be my response to that. I've considered everything. And I was very frank with Jennifer in our email communications about why I decided against certain things. Um, I was trying to be as honest and transparent as I could because I'm a human who really only has limited resources and I'm trying to make the best judgments I can for my home. I can certainly appreciate that. Um, uh, I am a, a historic restoration architect, so while I have not physically repaired windows, I have been involved with many projects where uh, others have. Mm -hmm. um, the, the interior secretary standards, which are the standards that we are supposed to uphold here on this commission is kind of our whole point, are pretty clear about, um, about windows being important and that historic fabric. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we've got a home from 1878, was it something like that? 1880, oh, mine? Uh, yeah. 1886. 1886, all right. Uh, maybe, maybe Rick was. So, a house that's been around for a pretty long time. Um, we've got a professional restoration contractor that you've connected with that could potentially do this work. Storm windows have a very long track record of being successful in historic preservation 
whether you get, and I, I tend to agree with Commissioner Norton that you may have a bigger problem than your windows based on what I'm hearing, but the, the storm window would be something that would be uh, appropriate to the historic home. It's a landmarked house, which for better or for worse, means it's got a higher standard that it has to meet than another home that doesn't have a landmark. With the storm windows, you would potentially save money over the replacement, and that would actually qualify for, its, for a tax credit. So you could come back in here with the work, with the receipts from that storm window replacement, and we could approve it, uh, and you could send it to the state and get a credit for uh, something like 30, you know, some percentage, thirty percent of the cost of the actual work that you could claim on your taxes. So it would be even yet more economically advantageous to do the storm. Mm -hmm. So I, I am still feeling like this is not uh, something that ought to be discarded. I think. I think yeah. No. Absolutely. I think if they could put in the storm windows before winter came, I would be all for it. Well, at the same time, the home has been there since the 1800s. And it's been in office since the 70s, it, not the lived The building in. has been there for that long. And to say then in absence of a handful of months, um, I, uh, I, sorry, I, I understand your position, but I, I don't feel like I could support an argument that says this material should be lost for the sake of six months. The material's not being lost. Um, I would like to restate there are small children living in the home that don't have free reign of every part of the home without coats and socks and shoes. Um, and I think disregard of that fact is harsh. The storm window replacement or creation cannot happen until winter is almost over or spring. That's the fact. Yeah, sure. Uh, Commissioner Jacoby. Uh, yeah, um, you, you've lived in the house, what, two years, three years, something like that? Two and a half years, yeah. Do you know how the office managed to survive if it was kept at 40 degrees in the wintertime? They had baseboard heating, which I took out because so, it was unsafe for my kids. So different heating system. You think your heating system can keep it up, but the old system did. Well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. I wondering. toured the house in January before we made an offer, right. it was toasty in there. It was, there were space heaters in every room and then the baseboard heaters were going. Um, but I do remember it being warm in there, hmm. which was part of <laughs> my somehow confusion it, about this whole thing. They made it livable somehow for yeah. 100 years before you were there. So well, yeah, I guess livable is the, oh, sorry. Well, um, they, they, managed a, a viable commercial establishment before you were there for, for years. Right. And before that, it was a house. It was a Bemis Rowan house. And I can tell you about those folks mm. who built it, too. Uh, but um, they did manage to find it, make it livable somehow. And I'm wondering what they did that you're not doing, unless it's the change in the HVAC system that is inadequate or, or something. I, I, don't I don't know. know. I don't know. I, I don't know either. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I haven't changed any of the structure of the home. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that it's it's drafty between the first floor and the second floor. Mm -hmm. There are lots of different rooms. And so when possible, I always keep those doors closed, right? Because that is the most efficient way to heat the home. But I haven't changed anything structurally about it. Mm -hmm. And I don't imagine adding more heat to the space would make it colder. Um, my only answer is, uh, I don't know, maybe they lived in the cold. Any other questions for the applicant? All right. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Yes, thank you for your time. Okay, so uh, with that, I need to officially open the public comment section of this. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on this matter? Sure. Please uh, come up, approach the, if you would just uh, state your name and address, please. I'm Kyle Schultz. I live at 601 Collier Street, so the greenhouse just across from Lizzie. Um, we have an equally old home. We have 
double pane windows. Those, those windows were somehow approved, I think in 2017 before we bought the property. So in any case, we just had to put a new heater in and the Boulder County requires a I think, energy efficient heating system now. And so alternative versions of heating aren't really up to code. So I just wonder if any of that is being considered in this in this discussion because we are required to have these <clears throat> H H E systems that are very very pricey. So that's my only comment. And again, you know, we we all bought these houses knowing they're historical houses. I grew up in Pennsylvania in a in a house that was built in 1850, and I know what it's like to be cold all winter, and it's not a very pleasant thing, right? Um, cold and damp in Pennsylvania. We have the rain, which we don't have here. Um, and I just think we're a lot of young families here coming to this community. It's really important for us to live in these homes and to be part of this community, but we do have to modernize and we have to adapt. And I know that that goes against preservation, that's against the, the, the word itself, but ultimately <clears throat> it's not very feasible for some of us. Financially, we don't have millions of dollars to do all of these things. Um, and time, we're raising families, I'm working full time I, you know, getting a contractor on the phone, like even just for a simple thing, we're having some plaster repaired. I mean, it takes months and to get people out there. And um, yeah, just to keep these things in mind about young families moving into the neighborhood and, and trying to balance your goals with our goals and making sure that we're all taking care of these homes. And that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Okay, I'll go ahead and close the public comment. Uh, and leave it to the commission for any further discussion. Oh, oh yeah, I'm going to call on Commissioner Byer first. So, um, uh, for the sake of discussion, I would, um, to see where we all are, I would move that we approve the application. Okay, I have a motion to approve the application and a second. Further discussion? Um, as the maker of the motion, can I speak? Sure. Um, I, 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 I just really believe we have to deal in a world of reality. And I understand I'm a very big supporter of the Secretary's standards, um, but I think that, you know, in a, re in a real world, we have to deal with people who have homes and and I, I really like the way that this application has been developed. I, I read it over the weekend, and um, I think there's a, a real effort being made to do what can be done within the scope of what's realistic to be done. And so I think we have to, we have, you know, we, we, we are a commission. We're not a rubber stamp. We don't just say, okay, boom, no, boom, yes, whatever. We think about things and we make decisions based on how we think they're going to work. I think we heard some opinions already on what people feel based on their own experiences. Um, so my, based on my experiences and my understanding and my expertise as to why I'm here, um, I, I, I would ask for support of this motion. Further comment? Commissioner Jacoby? It, it, this is a very difficult decision because we clearly all want to live in very livable homes. Uh, we, we want warm children. We want this to be affordable, and affordability in Boulder County is crazy, even in Longmont. And I'm torn uh, between the desire to help as soon as possible with the data that I've seen that says equal amounts of comfort can be provided more cheaply in a way that historic, that maintains historic preservation. That's what the data that I'm reading online says. And I'm not trying to be cold when I say that. I, I think, I don't want you to be literally cold. I think it's very important. I think, you know, you, you point out that safety is a consideration because of uh, old glass. Well, when you move into, do you ever move into a new historic home and plan to replace all the glass because of safety issues? No. You understand that's part of the house and that it has benefits with the beautiful poured nature of the glass and it has some drawbacks. It is more brittle and it requires more maintenance. And moving it to a greenhouse is not gonna make it safer in your, in your family, I don't think. But um, 
th there's lots of ways you can look at the data and you can shape it and point it in the direction you want. But the, the data that I see that seems to be least biased is frankly what I'm seeing online. And again, I encourage you to look at the, the National Park site, um, service site on historic preservation. Um, and I think that we can achieve the same goals uh, with comfort for less money by doing restoration rather than replacement. So I'm leaning towards not approving this uh, for that reason, not because I don't want to see you live there, not because I don't want to see you uncomfortable, uh, but because I think you can achieve the same level of comfort more cheaply meeting the historic guidelines. Other commissioners? Yeah, there we go. Okay, Commissioner Sibley. Thanks. Um, I Thank you for saying that, Rick. Um, and I really appreciate all the things that you're trying to do um, as far as reusing the windows and doing replacing like with as close to like as you can. I, those are all wonderful. Um, and this is really, it, it's tough. Um, we have denied similar types of applications in the past. Um, every time I go to any sort of meetings, conferences, um, windows are always the biggest topic. Once they're gone, they're gone. If it you know gets moved to a greenhouse and something happens to them there, they're they're done. Um, I I don't want you guys to be cold either. I really don't. Um, I I think that that's awful to hear those kinds of things. Um, I think if one person has said that yes, they can't start until fall. Yeah, um, maybe that's not the person to go to. I and I'm sorry, I have not called a bunch of people to see like you know who's busy, who isn't busy what kinds of resources out there. I think before I approve any sort of full-out replacement, um, I, I would really encourage you to just make more calls, and maybe you have, um, but I, I guess I'd like to see more denials. You know what I mean? Um, I just, once those windows are removed out of that house, they're removed, and I, you know, that's just, I, that, that's just like one of the biggest things that we hear in preservation and so I just I'm having a real hard time saying yes to that so um, that's really it. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, for my part um, you know I, I couldn't support approval of the application I think we as a commission have a very clear mandate to follow the Secretary of Interior's standards. The standards are really super clear. We have a path forward to improve the energy efficiency of the home in an appropriate way that's more economical, that's, that is a win for everyone. And that is the path that's established for this. And we have at least one contractor that, that can do it, and perhaps there are others. And if the issue is simply a, a matter of time, then you know, in the big picture of what happens 10 years from now with a landmark house, again, as it's already been stated, that once the windows are gone, they're gone. It, I think we have a clear mandate. So those are my comments. Uh, with that, unless there are no further comment, I will call for a vote. So we have a uh, motion on the floor to approve the application, and we have a second. All those in favor of approving the application, please say aye. Aye. So we have Commissioner Barnard and Commissioner Fenster. All those opposed? Nay. 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 So the, the application or the motion does fail. Uh, so I will need uh, another motion. I'll move. Yeah. Yeah. I'll move to deny to accept staff recommendation and deny the application. Okay, I have a motion to deny from Commissioner Norton. I'll second it. And a second from Commissioner Jacoby. Any further comment? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of denial of the application, 
Please say aye. 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 All those opposed? No. Okay. okay, so by the same score, we have uh, the, the application is denied four to two. We would strongly encourage you to go out there and get those um, uh, storm window quotes and and then come back and and show us that you put the storm windows in and we can approve a, uh, a, a tax credit for you and you can get some more money back. And I think it'll it'll work. Yeah. Steve, I have a question for staff, if I may. Uh, sure, I guess that's yeah. okay. Uh, Glenn, you and I have had some back and forth correspondence on the question of uh, of last resort and the dis when when is a decision of different commissions, uh, like the Planning and Zoning Commission, is a last resort commission? If you don't, if you don't. If you don't agree with the decision of planning and zoning, your option is to go to court. You can't go to the city council. No, I don't remember it that way. Um, if they're the final decision maker, the like a, a variance, then you go to the superior court. Other than that, you appeal to city council. Okay, so the, that the applicant here has a, the choice of either going doing a bunch of other stuff or appealing this decision to city council. Correct. Yep. Just want to make sure the applicant knew that. All right. Thank you. We do appreciate you coming in here. I know this is not what you wanted to hear, but um, we appreciate your time. Okay. We will move on to our second uh, item on the agenda, which is uh, new business, uh, an update on the steam and sugar factory sub area plan from Mr. Chacon. Um, just as real quick introduction, I think we are showed you or came before you with a, a presentation maybe two years ago. Um, we've had some stops and goes um, with this project primarily because we started, there was no interest in this area, and now there's a lot of interest in this area. So we've tried to mold the plan to kind of meet um, um, what some... Um, um, developer interest was showing us and so we have a draft that is being reviewed by staff at this point but we thought this was a good chance to come before you so I asked Tony Chacon our redevelopment manager to present what we have today um, and then ultimately we go uh, to the uh, Planning Commission will give a formal recommendation and then on to City Council great well thank you and welcome Mic turned on for him. Get your mic turned on. Uh, can we? Um, my name is Tony Chacon. I'm the redevelopment manager for the city. Um, and in conjunction with that, I also run the Urban Renewal Authority for the city of Longmont. And uh, as Glenn mentioned, one of our major projects is trying to get uh, the preservation of a significant portion of the sugar mill, if not all elements of the sugar mill, because if you may be aware, Parts of it have either crumbled already or have had fires associated with it. So uh, in that regards, we're seeing what we can do to move forward with preservation. So um, I'm here, I, I, this is called the steam or sugar factory and steam plan. And just to let you know, sometimes we um, use different terminology. There are people will refer to it as sugar mill. Uh, we've been advised it's a sugar factory, but it didn't explain how on earth the road has always been called Sugar Mill Road. So just to let you know. <laughs> so to this day, there's still confusion on that, but in reference to this plan, we're talking about the sugar factory. Um, I will uh, refrain from talking uh, substantially about the steam area because uh, I believe your interest is primarily with the sugar mill property itself and what that entails. So we'll be focusing on that as part of this presentation. So here you can see uh, a layout of what we have identified as the sugar mill redevelopment area. It includes uh, properties beyond those associated specifically with the historic buildings. It also extends out to Martin Street portions out there in, uh, primarily because we do have development activity that's starting to take place in that particular area. And then we're also going out to the intersection of 3rd and Ken Pratt 
uh, because we do have some development interest at that location. And just to let you know why we would look at bringing those into th this project or this project area is they have the capability to start generating revenue that we're going to need to make this project work. So um, some elements of the, the plan, the, the sugar factory plan that, and I'm talking about the plan now that the city is, is putting forth. Uh, this highly visible historic icon, which you all know that. Um, s operations ceased in the early 1980s, so it's been basically sitting vacant for that period of time. Uh, not totally true. Uh, the current owner utilizes it for his tinkering, so all the buildings are filled up with all sorts of equipment and such that he works on. Um, so historic structures are still standing in varying levels of, of of uh, condition, and if you notice, they didn't say in, in levels of structural integrity, because regardless of the brick falling down, it still has structural integrity, because it's actually a steel framed member that the bricks effectively just filled in the voids between the steel members there. So all the bricks could fall down, and you would still have the skeleton there. Um, it's underutilized as approximately about 200 acres of undeveloped island in total. And that's all those properties I've been talking about. And with it, there are several what we consider large undeveloped areas that really offer a great opportunity to generate development around the historic buildings, then also um, help us produce that revenue that's going to be needed. And of course, it's within proximity to the historic downtown area. So some of the challenges, I think the photos alone most probably give you some idea about the buildings that we're talking about. <laughs> so just let you know uh, that condition there up upper right corner, that that's actually the interior of the main factory building. And that condition is on all three, four floors of that, that building. So it's a pretty significant problem. Uh, some, some of the area challenges, annexation. So contrary to what a lot of people think, those parcels where the buildings are located and that, that large parcel just to the south where there's the metal shed and the outdoor storage, um, those are not within the city limits currently. And there's been a lot of reasons that have been put forth as to why the city doesn't want to annex it. At this time, the number one concern is the city then would have to take on responsibility for public safety and code enforcement. Um, there's environmental contamination and unstable soils. Um, so we have been working with EPA. They've done significant um, sampling in the area. Uh, they've done some phase one and phase two work and asbestos survey. And the estimate right now to clean up the property, including the buildings of asbestos, ranges from 30 to $50 million. So it's not cheap. Now, the question would be, why would you look to preserve those buildings with that cost estimate? Well, the reason is, even if you de demoed it, you'd still have to incur a significant cost on the asbestos remediation. You just can't knock it down. So. And on the other side of the equation, too, is if it starts falling down and gets exposed to the uh, elements, we have that possible problem regardless, too. So that's why we feel it's a little important to start focusing on this area right now. Uh, the demolition removal of the internal building equipment, um, there's just massive equipment in here that has to come out. There are boiler tanks as big as this room, 20 to 30 of them, and they're all on upper floors. Nothing's on the lower floor. It's all on the upper floors. <laughs> There's two large boilers that used to fuel this plant. They have to come out, and all this equipment is laden with this asbestos insulation product on it. Um, other challenges, of course, we have the rail tracks immediately adjacent and the sewer treatment plant. Those make a wonderful environment for housing development. Um, historic building reuse is unknown at this time. So given its present condition, it's really hard to figure out what you can put in there. We've had ideas ranging from markets, 
farmers markets to just general retail markets, restaurant space, hospitality, possible hotels, and so forth. But right now it's up in the air. And so without any prospective tenants, it makes it a little harder to move forward with any development at this location. Uh, <clears throat> and believe it or not, our development standards don't necessarily align with the vision of what this area could be. So for example, street widths. <laughs> our current development requirements have these masses street widths when we're trying to create a tight knit community that would promote pedestrian activity and so forth. Uh, lack of access and infrastructure is virtually non-existent. There is one large main sewer trunk line that runs through the site, but beyond that, there is nothing on the site that could service any kind of development, so that would all have to come in. And large mining and wetlands areas. So the southern part by the rail tracks is actually part of mining rights, and they have those rights for the next something like 10 to 15 years to actually excavate. So the question is how do you go about alleviating those conditions? So opportunities though, so I just taught all, said, talked about all the bad stuff. So let's talk about the good stuff the plan looks at. So again, number one, preservation and reuse of the historic buildings. We feel as staff it is very critical and I, I would contend that the community is behind this. It's critical to try and preserve as many of those, and restore as many of those historic buildings as we possibly can, okay? And uh, just for information, if you're not aware, the plant was actually built over a number of years and added onto, so there is no single architectural element on any of those buildings, they're all have a distinct period of time and a little variance accordingly. Uh, connectivity and enhancements to the open space in St. Vrain, we see that in our planning effort to better get across the tracks down to the St. Vrain Creek. Uh, right now, it's pretty much landlocked accordingly. Uh, looking for incorporation of sustainable practices, whether that be energy, or whether it actually be the type of building materials. We're trying to push uh, long-term adaptive reuse or reuse long-term on some of these buildings that would be built. Um, possibility of a visually appealing gateway into the city. Um, even though it's well into the city limits, it really is the first visual you have of Longmont from the east. Uh, center of Social and Cultural Activity, that's what we're looking for. Uh, agriculture and Historic Education and Programs. And so one thing the plan looks at is how can we build on the history of its agricultural base and not necessarily having production of agricultural product, but some support or educational component that would bring that to the attention of the general public. So. Yeah, we're talking about making this a nice part of the community, but we also want people to understand it did have a history associated with it. Uh, improved connectivity to downtown. Right now, now the rail tracks are a big obstacle towards that. Uh, really, the only way you can get to downtown is to go up to Third Avenue and then down Third Avenue. And at that particular location there, the traffic speeds are such, they're not very conducive to bicycle and pedestrian movements. So that would be one factor in this plan. Uh, and then qualities for, uh, uh, qualifies as an urban renewal district and TIF funding. So we have done a blight study, what they call a condition survey now. It's also a blight study. And the area, believe it or not, qualifies as blighted. <laughs> and therefore we can expand upon annexation to the city we can expand that area into the existing urban renewal district or create a separate distinct one for that particular area. And with that, then we would be able to access what is known as tax increment funds. And that's effectively the, month, the uh, taxes that are generated above what is currently collected as the development proceeds. And we believe uh, on full build out, it could bring several, it could bring excess of about $80 million 
that we could work with to help make this project happen. Uh, so again, our, the sub-area plan priorities, of course, you've heard this, housing. And so the plan is looking at promoting a diverse range of housing affordability. So I don't want to say it's affordable housing, but we, we need some elements of the lower income housing as well as some of the higher income housings to allow them to balance out. Transportation, uh, as noted, we need some better connections between the various uh, main roads in that general area. Uh, and that includes, of course, trying to work with the railroads to figure out how we get across the railroads or the notion has actually come out, the possibility, and it is referenced some in the plan that the possibility of negotiating the railroads relocating somewhere at some point in the future. We haven't started that yet, but it's a hope. <laughs> and then uh, development. Uh, this connectivity talks about primarily to the development opportunities, not only at the sugar factory area, but the steam area, in that there is high level of development interest in both those areas right now. And so what we don't want to do is create these islands of new development that are not in integrated with each other. And so that's what we're promoting as part of this sub area plan. Uh, community is, uh, basically building into any new development, these active spaces for people, and culture and arts is one element in that. And then sustainability, again, is trying to work towards a sustainable environment. Uh, just let you know, one thought we actually have from an energy standpoint is the proximity of the, the uh, wastewater treatment plant is such that you can actually get heat off the pipes that actually can serve a community there, which is rather interesting. So again, the sewer plant has a negative connotation, but actually may have a favorable, and maybe not just towards um, the development there, but if some agricultural elements like greenhouses and stuff were built into the project, that would be a good source of heat. So as I mentioned, uh, development requirements are such that it kind of imposes some challenges to getting the vision built in this particular area. So the plan talks about some proposed code modifications. Number one is increasing the allowable building heights. Uh, there are restrictions that effectively limit housing to about five, six stories, but there may be interest. Huh? Well, but if you have affordable housing, and yeah, he adds them on all the time for me. <laughs> we stand there with our hands going, oh, and if you do this, that's it. But generally, it, it, the building height uh, limitation is really challenging, and particularly as it relates to the factory itself, because that factory actually stands higher than what a five or six story building would be. So that's one thing we're looking at is building heights. Uh, most probably, uh, more, a little less restriction in the steam area because it's at a lower elevation, but we're also looking at it on the sugar factory also. Uh, so consolidation of the utility easements into the right of way. So right now, for example, the city's uh, electric utility, in addition to right of way, asks for a five to 10 foot easement <laughs> outside the right of way. And so what happens is your buildings actually have to be set back farther than what you would like to create this pedestrian environment. So that's one thing we're looking at. Uh, narrower uh, alternative street designs, uh, either reduce or eliminating the parking requirements, because one thing we don't want is a massive sea of parking, surface parking, and the cost to build parking garages is astronomical right now. It's about $40,000 a space. So the other option is let's see what we can do to minimize the parking need and uh, capacity there. Uh, regional storm detention and water quality. So we have a great opportunity in that the city owns land on the south side of the rail tracks. That's a sandwich between the rail tracks and the St. Vrain and actually provides a great opportunity to put in a high quality 
wetland area, and so we're looking at that. Uh, permit consolidation of smaller parks and plazas. So within the code, there is a requirement for developments to provide public spaces, and so some of these don't make sense on smaller developments. And so the idea is let's figure out how we collectively put them into one location so that you have a one acre or two acre space for people. Uh, and then we've t we're looking at the possibility of a regulatory overlay district to give us more specification to the type of product and how it would be laid out. And then uh, we, the, the plan has a recommendation that we, the city revisit uh, the Metro District Ordinance. So right now the Metro District Ordinance does not allow that district to encompass residential or include residential unless it's less than 50% of the square footage of the commercial, which effectively makes it impossible to utilize it in any reasonable capacity. So uh, that's something that we will be resurrecting hopefully with the city council at least for a discussion. And you would ask, what's the reason for that? Well, that's one way we can build all the infrastructure and not put a significant burden on the back of the city. Infrastructure and funding that's covered in the plan, um, we, we're looking to identify needed area-wide public infrastructure improvements. So the plan does detail a roadway network, a generalized roadway network, for example, within which you would do, uh, lay the utilities. Um, it talks about public, uh, pursuing public-private partnerships. Uh, what that effectively means is that we're out there partnering with the developers where they bring maybe three-quarters of the equity towards the project and then the, the public entities, primarily the Urban Renewal Authority, would bring maybe the other third. Um, looking at the potential creation of a special financing district, whether that be a metro district or other, such as a general improvement district. Uh, and then again, incorporate the area into an urban renewal district that would get us to the TIF funding. And then also pursuit of environmental and infrastructure grants and loans from foundation, state, and federal agencies. And for example, uh, the federal EPA has a grant to help fund remediation, the caveat being that the municipality actually has to own the property. And of course, we don't own it right now. So for example, we'd have to figure out a mechanism to, to be able to pursue those funds. But there is some money up there, out there, and it's little bits here and there. You know, it could be through the historic funds that are out there if they choose to pursue that route. Um, and so it's critical. So every, few million dollars helps. That's the way I'm putting it. <laughs> Hopefully you brought your checkbook. <laughs> I have the donation pan in the back on the, on the way out the door. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the plan also looks at some land use character and urban design elements, uh, historic restoration and reuse and promotion, higher density mixed juice development, uh, that would hopefully lead to some level of affordability. Uh, diverse housing provide a diverse range of housing, providing varying levels of attainability, and I put their life cycle adaptability. So, as one ages, and they don't need as much space, or if they need additional space for a new young one, they have the means of somehow adapting that to accommodate it, and so. For example, some housing that's being built now, they, they effectively build a large closet space into the house that can be converted to an elevator to allow older persons to be able to get to the bedrooms, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh, uh, employment opportunities, so this, most likely, area would most likely get an MUE designation, which is mixed use employment. And with the term employment, the primary emphasis is try and create and bring jobs into the area there. A variety of public spaces, 
ur urban agricultural elements, which we talked about, human scale and walkability, green infrastructure and sustainable en energy, and innovative storm water management. Those are all features that are uh, outlined in the plan. And then on the mobility side, uh, a emphasis on pedestrians and bicycle facilities. And I do emphasize that is most probably one of the biggest elements on the transportation that we're really pushing as part of this plan. Doesn't mean we won't have vehicular traffic, but we're trying to design it. It would be designed in a manner to minimize those impacts, for example. Provide multimodal circulation and connectivity. Uh, there is the thought that can we possibly extend either bus service or when rail ever comes, rail service to this particular location. Um, reduce parking demand and capacity, uh, enhance connectivity to, Saint, uh, to the various streets and greenways, and then pursue and incorporate public transit and micromobility measures, and then pursue at grade or grade separated crossings of the rail tracks. So again, that's where we're trying to figure out how to get up over around the rail tracks there. And uh, this is the developer that's currently, one of the developers that's currently looking at this particular site. Uh, this is just kind of a general conceptual idea. Uh, ignore the Italian architecture. You know, that's <laughs> <laughs> well, the story, the, the design for this group actually was out of Guatemala City. And so thus you can imagine their flavor for architecture. <laughs> right. And so, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, 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 I think it does give a generalized idea of how that area could become a robust and active part of the Longmont community. And with that, questions and comments, and you can send them to my email that's posted up there. <laughs> We, we could oh, probably I guess I'm find, not get any Glenn, comments. <laughs> <laughs> we could probably bribe Glenn to get a, uh, get us your email. But um, thank you. Uh, thank you. I'd I'd glad to answer any questions you may have. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Uh, uh, Commissioner Norton, did you? Or? Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your presentation and for the um, materials in our packet. I actually really love the direction this is going. And um, actually, a lot of the things I love about it have nothing to do with the historic preservation. But um, I, I feel like Longmont is really thinking in like some very contemporary, cutting edge, like urban planning ways with trying, you know, smaller streets and more mobility. And um, so I really like this direction. And I also appreciate the challenges that the sugar factory poses and I appreciate that that is still a concern that we maintain that because it really is iconic for Longmont so that's all I just think this is really cool <laughs> right. uh, let's see Commissioner Jacoby thank you uh, yeah two, two comments I guess I'm uh, I'm not a planner. Um, I wish I was. Uh, but you, you mentioned that wide streets. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but wide streets and then a setback for utilities as a hindrance for walkability. Uh, but all of our downtown has very wide streets and then quite a setback to the sidewalks uh, before we get to the property uh, proper for the homeowners. And it's quite walkable. And I'm trying to think. What makes that walkable despite the wide streets and the setbacks? And I'm, I'm thinking it's the trees and the heterogeneity of the neighborhood. We're so close to retail. And mixing retail with housing in very close context might make it walkable despite wide streets and setbacks and whatnot. So that was the one thought. The other thought was one I shared with Glenn a while ago, just the tin shed. Um, there was some talk a while ago about making an indoor athletic arena. And I thought, what a perfect purpose for a huge tin shed, but make, and that could be part of the public space, you know, the, the, you know, and who knows, maybe you could even put some solar cells on the top of it and make it renewable energy. So that, and just thoughts on the thing. Yeah, if I can respond to that. So yeah, right now the uh, City manager is in discussions with the developer about that potential reuse of that building there as one option. 
Um, the intent within the plan would be to preserve as many of those buildings as possible. But so that would include the tin shed, but it can't, we, we can't say that the tin shed could go away, but there is an opportunity to maybe even preserve a portion of it. Cause if you're familiar with it, there's a, it's kind of a two buildings put together. There, the northern portion is a little bit smaller, but it still has that uh, kind of architectural image. So I, there's there's options relative to its utilization, and not to say dismiss that that would be an important element or not. Uh, the plans would accommodate it uh, in place or some modification, therefore. But it, it's truly in the interest to try to preserve it if possible. Thanks, Commissioner Sibley. Oh, you lost you. Sorry. Yeah. Here we go. Too many buttons. Too many buttons. Um, so first of all, hurry up, um, because <laughs> because this sounds like a really fun place to retire, and I only have so many years. I'm no <laughs> teasing. Um, the other thing is, I come from the Detroit area, um, which as anybody knows, never had any issues with blight or anything. So that is a little different than here. Um, but I, uh, I used to do a bunch of tours um, of the Eastern Market area. And um, this makes me think of that because, you know, it was, you know, beer factories and cheese makers and, you know, and all these different things. And, you know, in some places there's actually people working and selling stuff in retail, but then also there's all these factories with these little tiny narrow streets. What a fabulous place. And, um, and a lot of that stuff is being redone, well, has been redone. Um, and so I look at this and I go, oh, my God. To have that in Longmont, how exciting. So I, I love this. <laughs> so thank you. And if I could just add to that, um, this actually, this project would be the first project in Colorado that preserved one of the sugar beet plants. Yes. All the other ones are getting torn down because they cannot find any viable reuse for them. So that's why, in part, we're strongly encouraging reutilization of these buildings. It's definitely an iconic, right? What what kind of jobs would you envision happening there if that's really a primary component? Well, again, you know, we, we've talked about kind of the agricultural theme, and so one thought is that we go out and look for some of these ag research firms. Hmm. So, uh, for example, there's a there's actually an internationally owned seed company in proximity, it's called Magno Seed. They're owned by some Swedish firm, large company. And so it could, we'd be looking at the possibility of trying to attract a single user or two, or you know maybe a handful that are involved in seed research. Hmm. Not necessarily Monsanto, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand that's a no-no. Yeah. But, <laughs> but there's that element. Uh, for, you may not be familiar, but a couple of years back, we had uh, Urban Land Institute do what they consider what they call a technical advisory panel, and that was led by a uh, the individual from Colorado State University that was involved in the National Western Stock Show I was bring that up. <laughs> uh, project. And to tell you the truth, we're using that as somewhat of a model for the energy component because they do that; they use the sewer heat. Um, uh, but having that tie in to CSU and their research component is a good possibility also. So, of course, there's most probably going to be a lot of like retail trades, hospitality trades if we get a hotel and stuff like that. But we do, we would still like to pursue some of these uh, higher earning and professional jobs in the area there. And I think the, the premise we're working from is if we can get that building cleaned up and restored, then it makes it easier to go to those type of groups to say, what do you think? Because then it's like, oh, yeah, I can see the vision as compared to the one slide I showed you, which is, yeah, yeah. I can't see the vision because of the holes in the floor and all the equipment down back. there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Commissioner Fenster. Yeah. <clears throat> Has any consideration been given to 
uh, using the facility, the premises, for education and teaching? Would there be any schools, for example, in the greater area that would be interested in utilizing the facility? Um, well, we're, we're in conversations with like the, the, the community colleges and CU, CSU. Nobody necessarily wants to build new facilities for education, but there could be elements where we create the space that could be utilized in some capacity and invite those persons to participate. Uh, one idea that has come to mind, for example, is um, there's a group out of Boulder that operates like urban gardens. And what they do is they provide education to the community and particularly youth on what farming is about, how to go about doing it, and what you can do with some of the product that you raise and stuff. So that be an education. And in that vein, then, we would be looking to work with the St. Vrain School District. Uh, we've talked about it. Could it be an agricultural innovation center to some degree as compared to their other innovation, which is technology, right? Yeah. So, yeah, we, we definitely want to figure out how we integrate some educational components into the, the area. Um, so, not agriculture, but another really large um, kind of adaptive reuse and development project is going on in Trinidad with an arts district. Um, and so that might be a really good model. There's a lot of public-private partnership money involved in that as well in historic preservation. That is a, um, Dana, Miss Dana's last name, who did Lodo. Oh, yes. Thank you, yes. It's too late in the evening. Um, Dana Crawford's involved in that, so there might be some other good models. Um, I'll keep all of my ideas to myself because ideas are a dime a dozen, but I know you need like executable stuff. Um, uh, let I, me just say, yeah. uh, if any of you have any ideas, definitely throw them our way because right now we're trying to think of anything possible. So even if it's the most outlandish idea, <coughs> gladly send it my oh. way. I'm awesome at outlandish ideas. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the less outlandish one that I would say is, especially with CU Boulder in such close proximity, um, yes, we have a huge ag and a, you know, a really big ag history, but we also have a really big um, space industry here, and there's a history of that, not only in the state, but you know, smaller connections with Longmont. Um, those folks are always looking for space, so that those might be some potential partnerships. Um, I'm, like my urban planning, I'm on the periphery looking in, but I, I know those folks exist. Um, my other question was going to be, as exciting as all this stuff is, um, some of the ideas about like hotels and music venues and, you know, these, these bigger things, can Longmont sustain that? Like, can we, if, if we build it, will they come? Or is it, uh, do we have studies on that kind of stuff? Well, I think it, let me t hospitality first is, um, first of all, the hotel industry is such that um, they're not going to build if they don't feel they're going to be able to fill the spaces, number one. That's the corporate entities. However, <laughs> there are boutique builders out there, of which we're having one build one in downtown here, that we never thought would come to the table. And so, there are a lot of those type of enterprises that are looking to basically build, you know, 100 rooms thereabouts, which could be built into a facility like the sugar factory. So hospitality, I think, yeah, I think people, we, we can easily fill space if it's built. Um, on the other side, like anything related to culture, performing spaces, things like that, I think a lot of it's going to be based upon the scale of it and what that niche opportunity is. So, you know, I don't think Longmont personally could ever take on the Denver Center for, 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 for Performing Arts, right? <laughs> I mean, competitive-wise, you're not going to win. Uh, but if you look at Fort Collins, for example, they've become the hotbed for small indie bands <laughs> touring Colorado right now. It is the number one touring city in Colorado for small bands. And that's because they have a multitude of smaller venues that they're able to 
provide for those those parties. So, so we're not saying the sugar mill necessarily have some big facility, but we believe it has the opportunity to have some elements that could kind of broaden our capability to host those type things. Do you know how much square footage of existing, even potentially usable building there there is offhand? Two hundred thousand square feet. Yeah, that's that's a, that's not small. Yeah, although um, a lot of that under its current structure, especially in the larger building, it's really not full square footage because it's got big open void areas for three stories. So it, they're not just wall to wall uh, concrete, basically. However, when they redo the building, chances are they're going to fill in some of those voids and get that, that space they need. Great, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Uh, we really appreciate you coming down here tonight. I know you had to sit here for a while, so but this is really great to, to get this information out to us, and, and we certainly appreciate the commitment to preservation, yeah. as you might imagine. Well, yeah, and I appreciate you all having me here, especially since Glenn said I had to be here. So. <laughs> Um, we are um, trying to host tours. Um, we've gotten most of the city council through. Um, there might be opportunities, if you're interested, to take a walkabout. Um, it's a climb because they bring you all the way up and all the way down, but um, there may be some opportunities opening up. I think um, uh, the person who has it under contract would really like to have eyes on the site and so you know what we're dealing with, but I don't know if anything's being scheduled now, but no, we'll... But I talked to one of them if any timelines are being set. Maybe if you want to converse about it, and if so, you can let me know. Yeah, I mean, just by a display of sort of head nodding, is everyone generally interested in that? I would expect, yeah. So I think okay. that's an adequate amount that, yeah, absolutely, if we had that opportunity, I think we'd jump at it. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oops. Um, you mentioned that this was the next step was uh, a lot of next steps, but eventually getting to the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, and then to the City Council. So I guess my question is, what role does the Historic Preservation Commission have in all of this? Well, ultimately, um, when we annex it and they want to designate the site, that would be your role. But as far as a land use plan, that's really Planning Commission, City Council's role. So we love your input, but we don't need a recommendation, I guess. Okay. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Running through the rest of the agenda, we do not have any prior business, so that leaves us uh, with simply uh, any comments from HPC commissioners. Anyone else have a, something they'd like to add? Mr. Commissioner Jacoby. At the risk of making the meeting, the meeting longer. Um, we, uh, over the last half year, we've talked about code revisions, and uh, we did We've talked a little bit on the side about the conservation overlay that the historic east side is trying to put forward. And I did mention that it's been difficult to practically use. Well, the, the historic east side is pursuing a conservation overlay. And now they, uh, the, the current roadblock, and I wasn't at the meeting, but uh, I've gotten some input and, and some folks here were, um, is they have to come up with a plan check fee of $2,250 on top of money that they've already acquired to send mailers to 700 residences to notify them of uh, the plan to go forward with a conservation overlay. Now, the overlay plan has been on the books uh, for 26 years, and it's never been used. And this is what I was saying. This is making it unusable. Um, the, this, they're going to go forward to city council is the plan. 
uh, and ask for the fee waiver. But that's solving the problem maybe, if city council agrees, uh, for the east side. We, we need to fix the conservation overlay, I think. Um, so I was thinking, I, I would like to make a motion um, that we recommend to modify, the, now the city code, let me back up, the, the city code talks about development to a large degree. It doesn't talk about not developing. You know, that's not what code's about. And so it's set up, it, it mentions in many places that 501c3s get exemptions, but neighborhoods aren't 501c3s, and unfortunately we don't fit in under an umbrella organization. And there are also exemptions for affordable housing. But there's, there's no mention for a way for historic neighborhoods to move forward here. So I would like to make a motion that we recommend to modify the city code. Uh, while we're talking about redlining and changing the other code, make a, a recommendation to modify city code to allow the planning director to also be able to waive the plan check fee for uh, city designated neighborhood groups that are in good standing that have no regular sources of income, such as homeowners associations. Because the east side, the west side, most of the older neighborhoods that could use this have no source of regular income, and this is not practicable for them to use. So I think if, if we could get that added to the code. Now, I, the code, I looked at the fee section, and it talks about, again, 501c3s and uh, whatnot. It says um, that uh, commercial structures may not be eligible, uh, talking about structures for building, but may be eligible when other in, under other provisions of this code. If we put this in just the conservation overlay portion of the code, that the director has the authority to waive that fee, it would be much more approachable for multiple neighborhoods. So what I would suggest, because I don't think this particular point of the agenda is appropriate for that, is that we talk about potentially putting that on the agenda for next month's discussion so that staff can that would be fine. Yeah. have a little bit of a educated response and we have a you time for... You can all for, think about it. Right, into there's it. time for debate and so on. So uh, I don't have any problem doing that. That would be great. I would be happy with that. And at one point to think about also is... Um, I, should I recuse myself from a vote in such a motion? Um, because I am working with the East Side neighborhood to get this approved, but we are working through a different pathway. We wouldn't be using, the code is gonna take a while to change and the, the neighborhood doesn't want to wait and they're gonna go to city council. So should I be recusing myself in the vote? I don't think so, but I, I leave that up to you and I'll, I'll go by everyone else's judgment on that. But well, we, we can yeah. talk about it at the next we meeting. We can talk about it next meeting. Put my, it on the agenda my, yeah, for the my, next meeting. My gut reaction would be no, because it's really just a discussion that the HBC is having about whether or not we think, the, as a commission, we want to make a recommendation to somebody else who's going to have to act on us because we don't have the power to do it in the first place. Right. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Any other commissioner comments? No? Okay. Uh, thank you all. Uh, we do not have a city council rep here with us tonight, so that leaves us with uh, a motion to adjourn. Moved by Commissioner Jacoby and seconded by Commissioner Norton. All those in favor of adjournment, please say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>